I find that British horrors can be very hit or miss. Well, most movies can, but from the ones that I've seen, it seems like British horrors do put more a focus on their characters, you know, their emotions, as opposed to big set pieces. And that is just what we get here in The Ritual. This is a movie that I'd seen in bits. It was on at Christmas one year. So imagine the scene, I am sitting there, food belly, letting that settle, waiting on dessert, having that kind of family chit chat. And every so often I turn around and see the ritual. I did see it. Every part of me did want to just shut everything off and sit and face the TV. Keep your fucking voice down. But cheesecake was coming, I had to be polite. I've seen photos of the ritual coming up, you know, people talking about the monster, people talking about different aspects, you know, they've just seen it and it's the scariest movie they've seen. And I thought I'd seen it. Well, I knew I'd seen bits of it, but you know that way you see a few chunks of a movie, it might be on in the background, and you just kind of put it together and don't revisit it? I'm fucking glad I revisited this one. If you haven't seen it, the movie follows quite a familiar story. It's a concept you've probably seen countless times before, but don't let that put you off. We open up on five college friends and they're wanting to plan the next kind of lad's holiday. What about Ibiza? No, we're too old for Ibiza. You know, they're throwing everything into the mix here, whether it's Ibiza and then a mountain trail path. Coming towards the end of the night, our main character Luke here wants to go in for one last bottle. You know, the pub was all well and good, but he does not want to stop. Oh look, there's that, look, I'm gonna get a bottle. Who's on it? He goes into the local off license, his friend comes with him, but this place is being robbed and they didn't realize. His friend gets killed, he didn't fucking do anything. He sat there, he was cowardly, but you know what, I kind of get his point, you know? You've got to survive. His friend was caught in the fucking headlights. No fucking move. Now we cut to six months later. It was his friend who passed away's idea to go to the mountains, so the remaining four decide to take it upon themselves and go in like memory of them. So they set off, they've got a three day mountain hike to do between Sweden and Norway. Now the gang aren't really suited for it. I think we could be carrying him out there like a fucking Egyptian princess if we're not careful. Hell, even talking to Luke is like an uphill struggle. <laughs> Now, whilst they're on this hike, you know, things turn a little bit awry. You've got Luke, who is feeling immense guilt over what happened. Should never have happened, but it did. Which is understandable, he just watched his friend die. He's not quite over it, it was only six months ago. So they all are coming to terms with their friend's death. He's a good man. The best of us. But he has the added dimension of just feeling an utter guilt over it, that not stepping up to the plate. And we have Hutch here, he's kind of like the leader of the group. The storm slowed us down, what do you want me to do? No one appointed him, but he's taking charge, he knows where they need to go and he's planning ahead for it. He's kind of like the glue that sticks this group together. You've got Phil, Phil hasn't developed too much, however as the movie goes on, yeah, he gets a little bit fucked. What is this? What is this? No, I don't know, man. And then we've got Dom. He is the most contentious of the group. Dom, come on, get up. No. He is a bit of a prick, but also understandable at the same time. He is the one that will call out to Luke that he didn't do anything. No, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. You know, so he's already feeling bad enough, and then he's calling them out further. Yet Dom isn't over what happened, and he blames Luke for all of it. Now, one of the reasons I think this movie just worked for me so much, even though it's a familiar formula, is the dialogue throughout it. It's a British horror, so with that you're going to get British dialogue, and that I find is very hit or miss. Morning. Fuck me, it's cold. Because I think when it comes to British movies, they have to toe that line between do they do stereotypical British, you know, or do they try and appease to American audiences as well? How'd you sleep? Uh, I could just walked up a big fucking mountain, man. Or do they just make it natural, make it believable for how people do talk to each other? And they fucking do. You're outside, you've walked into a fucking tree. Why do you have to fucking deny everything because I say? Because I... This is a group that will insult each other, but it's banter, they've got that throughout the hike. Now, is it me, or is it really quiet in here? All right, don't shit your pants. Even during their disagreements, they're not coming to blows because that's just how people do talk to each other. So whether they're being friends, whether they're coming up with a plan, or whether they're arguing with each other, you buy every line that they're saying, it's very believable. I'm not gonna plan a lad's holiday over a fucking avocado on toast, mate. I'm just, I'm not doing it. Very realistic in this movie. Now Dom, early doors, and I'm talking early fucking doors. He goes over on his ankle. <laughs> So he is now the slow one in the group and they need to alter their plan. It's going to take hours with an extra camp in the middle to get to their destination. Or they can take a shortcut through the woods. What are we thinking? And what I really enjoyed here, it wasn't Hutch the leader making that plan, it wasn't Luke either. Dom overheard them talking about it and just jumped at the chance to get there sooner. No quicker route, let's do it. So it's not as though he's tripped up, injured himself and the rest of them have put them in a shitty situation. 
he's kind of put himself in it. Whilst they're navigating this forest, you are seeing some freaky shit. We're seeing animals strung up in trees. It's quite clear something put that there. You're getting very specific cutouts and wood. You're getting symbols on the trees. Something just doesn't quite add up in these woods. Something is going on. There's the presence that people have been here recently, but they're seeing no people, and that just puts them on edge. Could be hunters out here. A bait, possibly. Or it's the bit they don't show you in the nature documentary. But with it being sleepy time, they come across a cabin and jump in. It looks empty, but we should leave it alone then. Let's kick it in. And they find like an effigy to something. They don't know what it is, it looks weird. And against their best interest, they spend the night here because they need shelter. And this is one of the first turns this movie takes. Because whilst they're staying here and that effigy is upstairs, they all get a little bit freaked out. <laughs> You've got the whole range here from Phil waking up naked, praying to the effigy. <laughs> and then you've got Hutch who just pisses himself. Jesus Christ. And now let's just come on to the monster. Let's come on to the thing itself. I fucking love the introduction of this monster in the movie. You know that vibe that Cloverfield had where it was huge, high stakes America and you just got glimpses of the monster until kind of the final acts? You've got that here, but being a lower budget British horror, it's got the same feel to it in just a completely different setting. You've got those small glimpses out in the woods. They don't quite know what it is, but even those small glimpses are enough for you to know that isn't an animal you'd expect to find. Even something as small as a hand on a tree, the hand is far too high for it to be fucking human. So we are not only getting glimpses of the monster, we are hearing the monster. We're hearing things that don't sound human and don't sound like any animals that you've ever heard of. And the movie does a great job of just teasing this, building it up, until you get the fucking money shot. It looks awesome. I still love this design. Thankfully, that was one of the things I did see at Christmas. It's just different enough from what you can conceive as a normal animal that it puts you on edge. I find these to be creepier than different animals and monsters. You know the ones that are just so far removed? They might be terrifying and scary, but you can't relate to it in any way. Whereas here, it kind of looks like something you've heard David Attenborough talking about. The frequency and quality of a buck's roar is an indication that he's in good condition but not quite. Some males thrash the undergrowth. Obviously the face is the main thing making you think not, but you get what I'm saying. And this movie has an emphasis on tension and suspense over the scares. And that is another big selling point I love. Those little scares and the tension are paced throughout the movie great. It plays with your imagination for most of the movie. You know, before you see that big money shot, you don't quite know what's happening. You don't know what it is, what it's going to look like, or what it's going to do to a human. One great example, one of the group is dead and they're hung up in the tree like the beast from earlier, and it doesn't just jump scare us with the body. Most movies would do that. It's a bit of a shortcut, it gets a scare out of you. Whereas what we get instead is the reaction of the group stumbling across the body, and it stays on their reaction for long enough. <sighs> You start imagining what it looks like, but then it cuts to it. Is that a hat? So it's not a jump scare that they've used. Instead, they've let you fill in the gaps. And before all is said and done, we come across the humans, the people in this town that worship this god. It's a god at the end of the day. They say it's like an offspring of Loki. Now, coming back to that very human emotion angle earlier, Luke is the main character was marked by this god early in the movie. You know, Hutch is pissing himself, Luke is getting marked by a god. Jesus Christ. So when they come across the village, they want Luke to worship it and not be sacrificed because he's had the mark. The god has like chosen him in a way. You will kneel before it like the rest of us. And he's been chosen due to his guilt, his internal pain that he is feeling. This ancient god feeds on it. He's also someone that will be susceptible to worship because of that. So the entire movie, from start to finish, even before we meet the god, is clearly about Luke overcoming his guilt, getting past it. Whilst he might have been able to do something, it also wasn't his fault at the same time. So he's overcoming two challenges in this movie, stepping up to the plate and overcoming what's happened. 
and Rafe done a fucking great job of that. You can see every expression, every micro expression on his face and you're with him. It's not a movie where you just want him to come out the other side alive. You actually want him to overcome his own demons. You feel for this man. That character development is key here. It's crucial. Without it, this movie would have felt so empty, but with it, it just adds so much context to what's going on. But a lesser movie might just rely on their very interesting, very unique kind of monster design but not here. That being said, it is still one of the coolest monster designs I've ever seen. Great concept, love the idea. The village is fucking creepy beyond belief. By worshipping it, they don't die. So there's some pretty old people here. I mean, pretty fucking old. Very simply put, this is a British horror that deserves to be on your watch list if it isn't already. I am unbelievably glad that I went back and gave this a go. So if you haven't, go do it yourself. Now, with all that being said, if you haven't yet, hit subscribe. That'd be fucking awesome if you could, or even just smash that like button. Pushes it out to more people. And as always, thank you so much for watching.